A while ago on IDU Curiosity, we visited Graham Anderson in Lightning Ridge and talked about the methods he has used to create amazing opal clay pottery with awesome experimental glazes. Rock is a, a low temperature glaze. Uh, it started off uh, in Japan for the tea ceremonies. Raku is a Japanese word that means enjoyment. After taking the pot from the kiln, throwing it into a bucket of leaves, sawdust, paper. Graham's style of Raku is adapted from the American method, which often results in more colourful and exaggerated designs through the use of chemical glazes. And the smoke from the burning stuff would get into the crazing in the glaze and they make it immediately look a thousand years old. <laughs> Welcome back to Lightning Ridge in the company of Graham Anderson, the opal clay potter. I was lucky enough to be present for one of Graham's legendary Raku pottery evenings. I caught up with the ceramic pyromaniac as he was setting up. So anyway, we shall continue loading the kiln. These are some that have been fired previously weren't happy so we're firing them again. These were done by some of the Raku mob from a few months ago and we didn't have time to finish them. So, so after they have come out of the kiln I'll let you know what's happened. So this is a simple little kiln here, which is just a box of bricks on the ground, one shelf, gas burner, the flame comes underneath the shelf, hits this end wall, goes back across the pots. So this is the lid of the kiln. So that's a, what we call the flue or the chimney or some highfalutin name like that. So this is just made out of ceramic fibre and the lid we put on has got a hole in it to allow the flames to come out. Actually if you see flames coming out you're wasting gas because it means it's not burning inside the kiln therefore it's wasted energy but it will also do a bit of reduction effect which is what we're getting with the reduction bins. So to explain reduction for you if you need to, reduction means the amount of air in the kiln for the flame to burn. You reduce the amount of air, therefore the flame hasn't got enough oxygen to burn, so it will take it out of the oxides in the glaze and the clay. Then when we want to take the pots out, someone will lift the lid like that and I will be standing there with a long pair of tongs, take the pot out, perhaps wave it round in the air a bit, which can look spectacular at night, with a, a red hot pot swinging around and then straight into there and starts burning. However, these are some of the pots going in. So I generally use a basic white glaze which is fairly stable so as long as you don't go too hot in which case it would melt and run a bit so we can do decorations like this these are some of Elizabeth Smith's Sora pots as we call them it's a play on the word sauropod <laughs> taking the pot out of the kiln at about a thousand degrees into 25 or so, naturally it's a thermal shock and the glaze will craze. So when you chuck it in the burning stuff, the smoke gets into the crazing in the glaze and makes the pot look immediately a thousand years old. 
and who's going to tell them any different? <laughs> now this pot here has been decorated with a glaze that I've put copper wire and steel wool into it. I've melted them with acids first and then added it to the basic white glaze. And Elizabeth has scratched the design through it, which is called Sgraffito. So now, hopefully, the glaze will come one, out one form of red like so. And this gone right back to the bare clay that should turn black, as also will the, the base of it, it'll turn black with the, the smoke from the, the bins getting into the clay. So it will change a lot of the colouring of the oxides on it. So that green might come out red. Your cobalt will turn out blue. Copper can go from green to red. <laughs> and well, it looks green now, but it might go red. And yeah. iron oxide. Mm. Uh, well, yeah, generally a reddish brown colour. So after Graham's guests have decorated their pots with scratch designs and various oxides, they're into the kiln, the pots, not the guests, and left for a specific length of time before being yanked out, spun around, and dropped into cans of burning paper. After a while in the paper, they're pulled out Hooray. and dropped into water to cool and get scrubbed down to remove any loose glaze particles and soot. And after all of that, this is what we get. Okay, so we fired three batches of nine pots each. So we created 27 in total, minus one, which Graham will show us in a moment. Uh, but out of those, most of them came out amazing. So what happened is when I came back the next day to speak to Graham about the outcome of the Raku firing, I kind of forgot that Graham is very much a man of science, a bit like myself. And what that means is that we had a really good long chat about how the pots turned out, but we only really talked about the interesting ones, which are the ones that didn't turn out the way we wanted them to. So just quickly, I'm gonna show you some of the amazing ones that did work out and came out much as they were expected to, including these pots, continuing Elizabeth Smith's sauropot series and these peculiar bubbly oddities from the first batch, which are the ones that were either fired twice because the original glaze wasn't satisfactory or were overfired either too long in the kiln or the kiln was too hot. Several of the guests who decorated their pots took their pots with them at the end of the evening, so I didn't get a chance to properly film the finished products in sort of decent light. But here are two that I have with me. This one is decorated with leaf patterns in blue from oxidized cobalt and bronze gold from oxidized copper. You can see around the edges where not all of the copper oxide has changed to the red color, which is pretty nifty. And this little cup, which was supposed to be a glorious chalice representing the history of IDU curiosity, but I'm now aware that my scraffito carving technique was kind of flawed and my scratches didn't sink deep enough into the glaze. In my defense, it was quite dark by the time I was decorating the pot and I'd been kind of busy trying to document everyone else's adventures when I should have probably been trying to make a pot look interesting. Anyway, you can kind of see that that was meant to be a pocket watch and you can kind of see that that's supposed to be a dinosaur and you can't really tell that that's meant to be a space shuttle at all. But you know what? It's still cool, and I've learnt a lot for next time. Speaking of which, I'll let Graham show you the other pots from which we learnt something. All right, well, so these ones, with all the, the bubbles, they were in the first load we put through, and I think it was because it got too hot. So the glaze was still boiling when we took them out of the kiln. They're, they're interesting, but not really what we, we wanted. <laughs> but as they're mainly a decorative item, as long as it's got beautiful colour showing up. So these ones which came out in the next two firings must have got the temperature right. So the glazes were fairly smooth. You can actually see what the decoration was with the dinosaurs, sauropods, whatever uh, paleontologists might call them. With the process of taking them out of the red hot kiln into the cold air, quite often the thermal shock will start cracking the pots, crack them right through, might even explode the pots if it any moisture left inside. 
One of the other things that can occasionally happen is what we call crawling, where the glaze is crawled away from the side of the pot. So there are several possible explanations for that. One, it might have had some dust on the pot when it was dipped in the glaze, or somebody's had a greasy finger marks which was on the pot before the glaze was put on. So from that point of view, the glaze didn't actually stick to that focal point there and then it just rolled back. So of course a lot of people would like that sort of thing. So overall it was a, an interesting experiment, very educational for me and I think the others learned a lot too. So I might have to get more technical next time and not, not over fire. <laughs> This video was made with the help of Graham Anderson in Lightning Ridge and with the enthusiasm of his guests, including several of the Australian Opal Centre's usual suspects, who you might recognise from other IDU Curiosity videos. If you enjoyed this video and you think I've earned it, please consider subscribing to IDU Curiosity on YouTube. You can also follow IDU Curiosity on all of the usual social media channels. It's all very much appreciated. Thank you for watching.